proposals and what you can include in your knowledge mobilization plan, what a knowledge mobilization plan even is, and some of the common pitfalls we see. So, uh, so that's what I'm hoping to cover today. Um, we are on Teams. It's supposed to be uh, interactive. So if you have a question, I'm going to stop kind of at designated points, but please feel free to unmute yourself or use the little hand raise button if uh, to give a shout out at any point if you'd like to like to ask a question. Um, I'm hoping to leave some time at the end to uh, for everyone to ask questions and uh, if we have time we can also workshop through uh, perhaps some of your own knowledge mobilization plans but we'll see how the hour goes. It always tends to go a little bit faster than we think. So um, a little bit about uh, me, I guess, before we get started. My name is Elizabeth Schantz. I work at the Research Innovation Office on campus. Um, where I have come from, um, I've been at Guelph for three years now. My work here focuses on, on supporting knowledge mobilization planning for, uh, for faculty and for grad students, as well as managing programs to support uh, the sharing of research with policy and practitioners. I largely work in the agri-food sector um, and I also do training and capacity building uh, on things like knowledge mobilization, plain language writing and research dissemination on campus. Before I came to Guelph, I was at uh, the Canadian Water Network for about six years. That's one of the networks, ne networks of centers of excellence funded by the federal government. Um, I worked in knowledge mobilization there as well. Part of what I did was managing a funding program specifically for knowledge mobilization in the water sector um, and I also helped to support knowledge mobilization planning and all of the grants that we funded there. So that's me. Um, my office, for those who don't know, I'm part of uh, the Research Innovation Office or RIO. Uh, we're a central unit on campus um, that's part of the broader Office of Research and we support faculty and students to share your research outside of the university for broader impacts. We have four main pillars um, in our office. Uh, we have industry liaison that helps faculty connect with industry or government partners. Uh, we have technology transfer that helps with licenses and patents. We have new venture creation that supports uh, commercialization and the development of new companies out of, uh, out of research. And we also have knowledge mobilization, which is what we're here to talk about today. So um, as I mentioned, um, there's a few things I'm hoping to cover related to grant writing and knowledge mobilization. So first of all, what do we even mean when we say knowledge mobilization? Because it's a term that I think is quite often misunderstood. Uh, secondly, why do we need to do knowledge mobilization? Why is this something that's increasingly required um, in our grant applications? Uh, thirdly, what are the questions that you need to answer when you're developing a knowledge mobilization plan? And then based on my experience, I want to go over some of the common issues that we've seen in knowledge mobilization plans. So it's going to be a quick hour. Um, before we get started, I always like to start out with a uh, with a story. So um, this is a story about a man in a hot air balloon and he gets lost and he descends towards the ground to ask a woman for directions. And the woman says, you are at 45 degrees, 25 minutes, 29 seconds north and 75 degrees, 42 minutes, 20 seconds west. I am standing about 100 meters above sea level, so you must be about 120 meters. The man says, you must be a researcher. I ask you a simple question, you give me too much information and I'm still lost. And the woman says, you must be a policymaker. You come out of nowhere with your questions. I give you the most accurate and precise answer I can. You're still lost and you blame me. So it's a funny little story, but I really like it because it it very accurately illustrates this challenge that we're facing. There's a real big gap between uh, research and the people who could use it. And knowledge mobilization at its heart is the process of trying to close that gap. So you may have heard other terms used to describe this process. Um, some of the popular ones that we tend to see are uh, knowledge translation, knowledge exchange, knowledge transfer. Um, the choice of which term is used 
largely depends, I would say mostly on what sector you work in. So um, if you're in the social, social sciences, uh, SHRC uses the term knowledge mobilization. If you work in the health sector, CIHR uses knowledge translation. Uh, NSERC has been known to use both, but um, has been using knowledge mobilization more recently. Today, I'm going to use the term knowledge mobilization because that's the one that I'm most familiar with. Often, these terms can be used interchangeably. Um, one more terminology note before we move on. Um, I wanted to define the term uh, end user or stakeholder that I'm going to be using today. So I'm using this word as just a blanket description of um, the group uh, or groups of people who could use your research or to whom you want to mobilize your knowledge. So depending on your field, this could include folks involved in uh, policy making. It could be people working in practice like farmers, vets, teachers, doctors. Um, it could include a variety of non-governmental organizations or specific segments of the public, media, etc. So it's just a broad term I'm going to be using to describe your audience. So knowledge mobilization, what actually is it? So when you look out there, there's a variety of different definitions of knowledge mobilization. So SHRC, you'll see here, defines it as um, the reciprocal and complementary flow and uptake of research knowledge between researchers, knowledge brokers, and knowledge users in such a way that may benefit users and create positive impacts. So this is about how we can use research to inform decisions, services, policies, practices, or, or and otherwise create impact. Um, CIHR adds that it is an iterative process that uh, includes knowledge synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and application. So essentially, knowledge mobilization is about moving science into action. My favorite definition, because it's so simple, is that it's about sharing the right information with the right people at the right time in the right format so that it can be used. Um, some definitions of knowledge mobilization also use that term um, to describe the flow of knowledge uh, within academia, either within your own discipline or to other disciplines, um, as well as talking about um, commercialization and technology transfer. Uh, or they ask you to include that in your knowledge mobilization plan, even if they don't necessarily define it as such. Um, today, I'm going to focus on knowledge mobilization um, outside of academia, uh, not within academia because you know your field's best. Um, and if you're more interested in sort of the commercialization tech transfer side, there's also other advantage workshops that are more focused on that. So for the grant that you're applying to, I really just recommend that you look at how they're defining knowledge mobilization and what elements they want you to include in your plan and make sure that you that you include those. So what does knowledge mobilization actually look like? Um, when we talk about uh, knowledge mobilization um, within academia, most people typically think of what CIHR calls end of grant knowledge translation. So this is where a research project is completed mostly in isolation. Um, you do your research in your lab, in the field, um, with your participants. Um, but there's not much feedback or input from partners or end users throughout the process. Um, and then after the research is complete and you've analyzed your results, you share those findings with your stakeholders, with your end users, with the hope that that research will um, inform the way that they do things. So this end of grant uh, kind of knowledge mobilization strategy can sometimes be effective. Um, but uh, when we look at the literature, the actual research on knowledge mobilization, we typically find that the more effective path to research impact um, is through what we call integrated knowledge mobilization if you want to achieve kind of a long term sustained impact. So this um, integrated knowledge mobilization is when stakeholders are as a description might, uh, might indicate that they're integrated throughout the research project, um, ideally right from the beginning, right from the planning stage where you are right now. So this can include um, soliciting their input at every stage of the process. They could provide feedback and have input into the research topic. Um, you could talk about how that topic applies to their day-to-day -day life and what questions they're really struggling with. Um, 
they could have input into how the research is conducted or potentially even take part in conducting the research depending on what you're researching um, and if it might lend itself to that kind of um, a format. Uh, they might play a role, and this we see as a more common um, piece, they might play a role in helping you to interpret how your resi results apply in their situation or helping you to get it in the right format, perhaps editing something that you're trying to use as a communication product to make sure it's in the right format and the right language for that audience. Um, so this, uh, you'll have noted in the, the SHRC and the CHR definitions, they talk about sort of reciprocal and iterative exchange of knowledge. Um, that's what this integrated knowledge mobilization is all about, creating opportunities uh, for knowledge to flow back and forth between you and your end users to make sure that the, the project um, is targeted towards the questions that they want to know and that it can um, be shared with them in the best possible way. So in practice, this might include creating um, an advisory committee, perhaps on your research composed of end users that meets regularly for updates, or um, it might include, um, as I said, recruiting end users to help review the products that you're creating, um, help you disseminate to others uh, within their networks, or lots of other potential topics, depending on what your project actually focuses on. What this looks like in practice is going to be something that you're going to have to negotiate between you and your end users, you and your partners, depending on um, how much they want to be involved, how much it makes sense for them to be involved from your perspective, um, and essentially just uh, something that should be negotiated up front. So engagement on this scale that we're talking about can be quite time consuming, and I do want to acknowledge that. Um, it does, however, tend to lead to higher impact. So I really like this spectrum um, of stakeholder engagement in, in research and in knowledge mobilization. So take a look at the spectrum and think where along this your knowledge mobilization plan might fall. Um, are you just planning to inform your audience? You want to consult them, involve them. It's not necessarily worse or better to fall more on the left side versus the right side. Um, either strategy is fine, but just know up front which approach you're going to take. And I would also suggest again going through the information um, in from the granting agency about your knowledge mobilization plan to see if there's any indication about what kind of approach might be preferred. Um, if you're working with uh, SHRC, for example, um, or you're, you're applying to a grant that puts a heavier emphasis on knowledge mobilization planning, you might want to move from inform to consult, for example, to show that you've done that engagement work. Why do we actually need to do knowledge mobilization? So this is something that over the past decade or so, we've seen crop up more and more in um, requirements for, for our grants. Why do, we, why do we need to do this? Um, is it not just something that happens organically? So research um, shows that there really is a significant gap between what we know um, through the best available science and what we do. So a lot of the research on this has been in the medical field so far. Um, so um, how many years does it take for evidence to reach clinicians? Um, some studies have shown that it can take up to 17 years uh, for new knowledge in the medical field to reach clinicians. Um, for that same knowledge to reach the general public, it can take up to 30 years. Uh, there's other pieces of research that show only about 50% of Americans are receiving the best recommended care um, and 20 to 25% of the care that they receive may either be unnecessary or maybe actively harmful. Uh, another example that my colleague Dana likes to, to, to cite and that I really enjoy as well is um, from the health and nutrition field, um, the research on trans fats. So research uh, coming out in the early 90s started to show the health risks associated with trans fats, but it took another 12 years before labeling of trans fats um, was required on products and 13 years beyond that labeling um, rule for trans fats to be banned in the US. So some of that is due to uh, delays in the political system and some of that is due just to the length of time that it takes for science to get out into the world. So 
we need knowledge mobilization plans because knowledge doesn't just, as I said, move organically. Um, there's also a moral argument that some people use. Research is publicly funded and we should try to maximize the public good um, of our research uh, because of this. And of course, there's the simple practical reason that um, more and more we see granting agencies requiring a knowledge mobilization plan. Um, often, knowledge mobilization plans are misunderstood and can kind of thought in many of our grants. So by developing a strong knowledge mobilization plan, you're going to enhance the competitiveness of your application. So you've got kind of the necessary reason, the moral reason, and the practical reason there. So why do we have this gap? Why does it exist? Um, there are a number of different challenges and barriers that make communication between researchers and end users very difficult. Um, on the left hand side here, you'll see some examples of um, why researchers report that doing knowledge mobilization can be difficult. Um, these include lack of time, lack of funding, lack of training in um, knowledge mobilization, as well as, of course, um, lack of incentives for or recognition of knowledge mobilization. I'm sure you're very familiar with many of these, so I'm not going to go over them in, in detail. Um, research users also face a number of barriers when they are trying to access research to use it. So they similarly often lack time to look into the literature. Um, many times they can't access research even if they wanted to because it's behind a journal paywall. And as we all know, journals are extremely expensive and their organization just doesn't have the funds to access research. Um, a number of times, too, we see that research users feel that they don't have um, either the skills to identify high quality relevant research. They don't necessarily understand how that research is relevant to their context or their situation. Um, and they also may not understand uh, research in the way that we often write it, which is in highly technical language. So it's clear there's a number of barriers on both sides that, that stop transmission of, of information between us on the research side and those who are our knowledge users. So some of the things we can do to bridge that gap include making your research um, open access, making it easy for your audience to find, uh, providing short and concise summaries so they can look at those and assess whether or not it's a piece of research they want to dig into in more detail. Um, we can use plain language, we can avoid jargon, um, and we can focus on how that research is relevant to the concerns of your audience. So it's clear um, through a number of different studies, knowledge mobilization isn't something that just happens, um, but it's a process that we make to happen through good planning um, and good communication. So what I want to do next is launch into the five questions uh, that you should include in your knowledge mobilization plan, but I want to take a pause here. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask about the information that I've just covered so far? All right, hearing none, um, I'm going to talk about the questions that we should answer in our knowledge mobilization plans. So, what do we have to include in a good knowledge mobilization plan? And here is where um, this is a little bit frustrating for many people because I don't have um, a one size fits all answer here for what a good knowledge mobilization plan includes because the best knowledge mobilization plans are tailored to your specific audience um, and your specific research project and context. But what I'm going to do is, is give you five questions that you can walk through and you can jot down your answers as I'm talking here if you'd like um, that you should include in your knowledge mobilization plan. So first of all, who is your audience? Um, why do they care? What do you need to share with them? How are you going to share? What's your dissemination mechanism going to be? And um, what impact do you want to have? And are you going to evaluate that? So first question, who is your audience? So when you're developing your knowledge mobilization plan here, you want to identify your audience as clearly and specifically as possible. Um, 
you don't want to necessarily have a product or a knowledge mobilization plan that suits all needs for all kinds of audiences. Different audiences are going to want to know different information presented in different ways, and they're going to use it for different purposes. So you can have multiple audiences for your research, but uh, I always find that it's ideal to come up with a different plan um, for each of those audiences and figure out where you can repurpose or repackage materials from your audience to the next. Thing. That's appropriate. So once you've identified your audience, um, I find it very helpful to come up with what barriers they might face when they're trying to access research or when they're trying to work with you if it's more of an integrated knowledge mobilization plan. So we said the list of barriers above. So what is that particular audience actually facing? Are they facing a lack of time or access to research? Um, is the issue perhaps that they don't understand the language being used? Or is the issue that they don't see the relevance of the research to them? They don't understand how they could apply that in their daily life. So each of this, these barriers might suggest a slightly different approach to how you could um, share knowledge with them or engage with them. And on the flip side to thinking about what would facilitate partnerships, um, are there existing relationships that you could draw on either with yourself or potentially with your colleagues um, who have strong relationships with members of that group already? Uh, or, for example, does uh, that audience, are they working in a, in a government that highly values evidence-based decision making and that's the tack that you could take to, to speak with them? Are there any levers that will help you get them involved in your research in other words? The second question, once you've identified who your audience is, uh, is to reflect on why they might care about your research. And I think it's it's often an assumption we can make we, we make that um, it's an important topic, so they should care. But I think it, it's worthwhile to do some thinking and some digging and some talking to members of your audience, if possible, to really understand how does this relate to what they care about on a daily basis? How does it help them to achieve their goals? How does it help them to address challenges they're facing? What do they really need to know? So as I said, this is where having a, a sort of a team member or an advisor from your target group can be very helpful to discuss this with them. And if you don't have a person that you can speak to from, from your target audience, I recommend um, going to an organization that might represent your target audience um, uh, to see what they've got on their website, to see what they have in their documentation. Perhaps you might spend some time on Twitter, on social media to see where the frustrations are. Um, or to get a sense of, of what they're thinking. So it's that kind of time consuming background research that can be difficult, um, which is why I recommend always speaking somebody with somebody if possible, but it can be very helpful uh, to, to, to do that research to understand their why. Now, this next slide is a chart um, that uh, it was developed by, by Dana on the new venture creation side um, to help researchers think through creating a value proposition, but I've included it here because I think it's equally important to think about this in the context of knowledge mobilization. So using a chart like this helps you map out where there is overlap between the funders goals, um, between the pain points and the goals of your audience, and between your research. Um, so how the knowledge you're producing can help to relieve those pain points or help them achieve those goals. Just mapping out that relevance and that fit, I, I always find very illuminating sometimes. The third question um, that you should think about when you're developing your knowledge mobilization plan is what information needs to be shared. So uh, depending on what kind of a grant you're applying to and what stage your research is at, this might not be a question that you can necessarily answer yet. Um, if you're at a very early stage of your project, you probably don't know what information needs to be shared. However, if you're working on a knowledge mobilization specific grant application, you'll likely know exactly what information needs to be shared. Um, and you can think through the details of, of what and how that should be that should be shared with your audience. So here, what I'd ask you to think about is um, exactly what people really need to know. So for the audience that you've identified, what, what, what needs to be shared and what can be removed? So can you take out information on your method? 
questions? Or can you take out some of the detail in your results section to distill those core concepts down um, to something like a fact sheet or a short video or a policy brief that's very succinct? Um, you can always pair a longer appendix with a shorter document if you are afraid that something might be missed. But this, figuring out what's really relevant in your in your content to your audience and, and being able to distill it down will help to cut through the noise for that audience. Um, I'm going to take a moment here too to talk about plain language. So. Plain language is something that um, I would say if you're talking to uh, any kind of non-academic audience is important to um, to consider using. Um, it's something that I think is often misunderstood, so I'm going to take a minute here to share some of the basic rules. So um, plain language is not about dumbing down the, the concepts or the ideas that you're trying to share, but instead it's just about using language that's appropriate for the audience that you're trying to reach um, and it's easy for them to understand. So the, the choice of the words that you use as well as style and design elements can help the audience um, to uh, find what they need, understand what they find, and use what they find to meet their needs, um, which I think is the best definition of plain language that I've seen. I also recommend using plain language in your application itself, uh, at least to a certain extent, if uh, you have, uh, if there's a possibility that you have reviewers who are not familiar with your subject matter um, area, it can just help them to interpret what you're trying to say. Uh, it, making it easy on your reviewers is always better than making it very complicated. So a few rules of plain language uh, before we get on to the fourth question. So first rule is to avoid jargon. So as we go through our academic careers, um, we are trained to use more and more jargon. And when I say jargon, I just mean language that's specific to our field that has specific meanings to those within it. So jargon is useful because it lets you communicate faster with colleagues who share an understanding of what those words actually mean. But for audiences who don't share that same understanding, it can be a significant barrier for them to understand what you're actually trying to say. So as much as possible, um, avoid jargon in uh, your knowledge mobilization products, as well as potentially your, your grant, uh, if that seems feasible, unless you are positive that your audience uses the same jargon in the same way. Often people are tempted to define all of their jargon and use it anyways. Um, as much as possible, I suggest trying to avoid that because uh, it's a barrier to understanding. It's like trying to read in another language where you come across a word and constantly have to refer back to the definition. So if that word, if that piece of jargon is not something that you can um, replicate with a, with a simpler word, then you can use it and define it, but try not to do that too often. Um, another helpful tip to avoid jargon is to consider checking the grade level of what you're writing. Um, Word, uh, Microsoft Word has a new multiple that you can use to do this, or there's um, readability checkers online as well. So when you're talking about the general public, they usually access articles that are written between a grade uh, 7 to 10 reading level. Um, some of the academic writing that I've just for fun tried to, to plop into a readability checker comes out around a grade 17 up to a grade, say, 23 or so reading levels. Um, very different from, from the words that the general public usually uses. Uh, another quick note on jargon as well. Um, even language that we don't necessarily consider be jargon specific to our fields can sometimes be misunderstood. So this chart here is just a sampling of words that have different meanings uh, to scientists than they do to the general public. So as an example, if you're talking about the data manipulation that you completed, uh, a member of the public might feel like you're talking about how you tampered with your data to get the results that you wanted, um, rather than just sort of the, the normal process of data organization and processing that we mean when we that word. Uh, another one is acronyms. Um, we overuse acronyms terribly in academia. Uh, similarly, try and find out how you can reduce your use of acronyms. What are some simpler words that you can use instead? Again, it's generally a good idea not to explain your acronyms and use them anyways unless you have to for uh, the comprehension of the, the content that you're trying to share. Uh, third rule of plain language, um, 
don't choose a complex word where a simpler word will do. So this isn't necessarily about jargon or technical terminology, but instead it's about choosing the simplest possible words to make up your sentence. So for example, say use instead of utilize, say next instead of subsequently, start instead of commence. Um, there's more examples out there. We're very guilty of using these, these larger words in our writing frequently. Uh, plain language is also about using the least amount of words possible, so don't use a phrase to represent what can be said with one word. So instead of saying at this point in time, you could just say now as an example. Uh, last point on plain language is that think about the relevance of the content you're trying to share. It's not just about choosing the right language, but you have to add context to the information that you're sharing. So this is where you can go back to your identified audience and understand what that information really means for them. How does it fit into the context of what they know? How does it affect their current concerns? Um, it's all about finding overlap between what you have to say and what they care about. And if you can't find that overlap, your message is likely to be lost um, or ignored as irrelevant to them. So um, a few more uh, rules of plain language here. I'm not going to go into them in detail at all. If you're interested in talking more about plain language, um, we offer a specific workshop on plain language, or um, we can also work with you one-on-one -on -one to help you make sure that something you're writing is plain language. So with that plain language interlude uh, over, I want to revisit the fourth question. You should include in your knowledge mobilization plan, um, which is choosing the format that you're going to use to share information. So again here, this is where you can go back to your audience and think about how did they prefer to access information? What are perhaps the newsletters or the websites or the podcasts or the other places that they use regularly? Um, also think about what might make it difficult for them to access information. So as an example, um, is, are you trying to work with a rural community that has poor access to internet, uh, in which case you might not want to do uh, an, an image heavy webinar, for example, um, or is travel an issue that might stop them from attending an event in a time when coronavirus is not present? Um, third question around choosing your format is think about who is a credible messenger to your audience. Who do they listen to? In some cases, perhaps it might help for you to co-present with a member of the community that you're trying to reach because that might add credibility to the message that you're sharing. Or you might consider partnering with an intermediary organization as a dissemination partner instead of trying to go it alone. Another question to consider is timelines. Again, depending on your audience, this may be more or less relevant. Um, for example, things in government tend to grind to a halt during election season. Uh, if you're trying to get something into the budget, uh, you probably don't want to be approaching members of government in February when the budget is due to come out in March. Um, or if you're working with farmers, for example, they're likely unavailable to come to events during spring and summer because they're in the field. And the final question here is consider whether or not you have the time and the resources to do the work. So often we might say we're going to create a website or develop an app um, or do an infographic, but do you or members of your team have the capacity to do that work? Um, can you provide relevant capacity development experiences for your students that would enable them to do that work? Or do you need to build an extra budget to hire somebody? Best practices um, according to the research on what works for knowledge mobilization. Um, we know that instead of just one single method, using multiple methods or layering methods uh, is an ideal way to expand the reach, the reach of your knowledge mobilization strategy. Uh, if possible, interactive strategies are often better than what I would call a more passive strategy. So a more passive strategy might be putting your data up in an open access repository online, um, but your audience find it would have to go searching. So instead of um, trying to get them to go to a place that you are putting your, your data, is there any way that you can um, share information in the, using a channel that they're already using or have a more interactive or active um, mechanism? And finally, it's always a good idea to uh, develop uh
communication products with a member of your target audience or have them review or test something you're creating before you finalize it because they can give you very valuable feedback about what's resonating and what's not with that audience. So um, this next slide, uh, you have a copy of these uh, slides, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This is just sort of a non-exhaustive smattering of potential dissemination mechanisms. Um, as I said, I often suggest layering these. Um, perhaps you might have sort of a one-page executive summary with a three-page uh, report with a 25-page um, longer report that could be just, just uh, a journal article that you created, for example, or you might want to develop an infographic, a video, and a policy brief to share alongside your paper on social media. There is no rule for what is best here. It's just going to depend on your audience and what works best for them. The final question to think about including in your knowledge mobilization plan is, is what effect uh, you would like to have. Um, so is your goal just to raise awareness of something? Do you want to change behavior? Or do you want to change policy? Um, so once you've identified this goal, it can be helpful to revisit your whole plan with an eye to that goal. So if, for example, you want to change policy and that's your whole goal, have you targeted policymakers as one of your audiences and have you chosen the right format to reach those, those policy makers? Um, some granting agencies require now an evaluation plan, so not just talking about the outcomes that you expect to happen as a result of this research, but actually requiring you to evaluate them. Um, if this is something that the grant that you're applying to is looking for, um, in my experience, we have seen a lot of um, of reviewers who think that there's a lot of room for improvement in evaluation plans. So this is one area where if you can take the time to put an evaluation plan into place, you, your application could really stand out from others. So um, if you're developing an evaluation plan, one common tool that I use to map out kind of um, your activities to expected outcomes is a logic model like this one. So you can map out exactly what you're do with your knowledge mobilization plan, um, the short-term outcomes, medium-term outcomes, and the long-term outcomes that will lead to your eventual impact. So if your grant has an expected outcomes section, um, you may want uh, to use this kind of a strategy. You don't have to put this necessarily in your knowledge mobilization plan, but it can help frame your background thinking to map out how exactly the activities that you are doing are going to lead to the short-term outcomes that you want to see that will lead to that eventual impact. You want to make sure that those dovetail because too often we say our, our intended outcomes, but they're not really relevant to the activities that we're intending to do. Um, if you have to put an actual evaluation plan uh, into place, you want to consider what metrics you might use. Um, so I find evaluation is important to include uh, for two reasons. Um, First of all, it helps you to assess whether or not you've achieved the impact that you want to do, but also if you can put an evaluation plan into place and see how your research has been used, that information can be very useful when you're writing future grant applications. So this slide here just has a few different indicators you could consider using. You can look at things like the reach of your activities, how many people came to your event, for example, um, whether or not they found the knowledge useful, um, whether or not they intend to use that knowledge, that behavioral intentions aspect. Um, and you can also gather information on how your activities, uh, your research have, have impacted things like actual behavior, programs or services, policies, knowledge change, that kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, these are the kinds of changes that do take a long time to happen, and they're often difficult to attribute to a single project. So evaluation on these longer term impacts can be uh, difficult, but if you can do it, it can also be very worthwhile. So those are the five basic questions uh, that I always suggest uh, thinking about 
doing some writing about and including in your knowledge mobilization plan in your grant. Um, and what I want to finish up with here is just some of the common issues or the critiques that I've seen come up in knowledge mobilization plans from review committees. So I'm just going to launch right into these. We'll spend a few minutes talking about these common issues and then I'm going to open it up for, for questions or, uh, or comments if you'd like to have some help to workshop through a, a knowledge mobilization uh, plan of your own. So one of the first sets of issues that we see is often related to your end users. So sometimes people haven't necessarily been specific enough or clear enough about who your audience actually is. Um, a frequent one that we see is people say, well, the general public is my audience. Uh, but is it really, is the general public really your audience? Is it a specific subset of the general public? Uh, are they really interested in the research that you have to share? Does it really apply to their daily lives? Um, and sometimes people also aren't specific enough about how they're going to reach that audience. So sometimes people will say farmers are my target audience for my research. They need to know uh, the information that I have to share. But instead of saying my target audience is farmers, it might be better to say my target audience is um, cash crop farmers in southwestern Ontario, and we plan to reach uh, these farmers through our partnership with uh, the uh, Ecolog Ecological Farmers Association of Ontario, for example. So make sure that you specify clearly who that audience is, how you're going to reach them if it's sort of a widely dispersed audience. So another example might be you're trying to reach um, human resource professionals. Instead of trying to go at it yourself to reach human resource professionals, perhaps you may want to consider partnering with an association of human resource professionals. Um, if you're dealing too with reviewers who know your target audience very, very well, and we see this sometimes with um, grants that are uh, very specific in nature, um, we will sometimes see questions about why a particular organization or a particular individual hasn't been, been engaged as a partner because they would be such a perfect fit. So here's where it can be important to do your research and make sure that you have uh, some of the right people engaged or you've talked to the people who can let you know if you've talked to the right, if you've engaged the other right people. Sorry, that was a little bit mixed up. Um, one of the second types of issues um, that we see, and I would say that this is one of the more common ones, is that there is a lack of engagement with end users. So proposals sometimes say this end user is our target audience, um, but they haven't actually shown, um, or the review committee raises questions about whether that audience is actually interest, interested in the work that you're doing, or if you're just assuming that so this is where it can be helpful to show that you have had uh, perhaps meetings with members of your target audience in advance. Um, if the rules of your grant allow, I'm also a really big advocate for including letters of support from organizations. Um, I know it can be a pain to go out and solicit these letters, but if you're intending to partner with organizations, it doesn't have to be just letters of support that show cash or cash or in-kind support. You can use letters of support to show that your target audience is actually interested in the proposal and they've, they've thought through how they might use the results. Um, as I said, another critique we sometimes see is that um, in knowledge mobilization heavy grants, um, there's no real plan for meaningful involvement or feedback from end users if you're working in a situation where that might be helpful. Um, cash or in-kind contributions, of course, are a strong indication to review committees that partners are interested in the research topic, but um, especially in this era we're working in now where organizations are going to need to tighten their belts a bit more, um, I do think a letter just expressing interest can be, can be beneficial as well. Um, third series, I would say, this third set of common issues that we see are related to the dissemination methods that you've chosen. Um, so some review committees might feel that the plan that has been chosen is not appropriate for the audience. So as I said, if you're trying to reach an audience um, of rural communities, you might not want to choose webinars. Um, sometimes people default to creating um, an app, for example, but um, 
will your audience actually use that app? Is there evidence that that they want something that serves that purpose? Um, another issue is that we often tend to under resource our knowledge mobilization plans. Um, this can happen either because we don't set aside enough money for uh, what we're planning to do in the planning stage, or sometimes research can be more expensive than we anticipated, and that can take a chunk out of your knowledge mobilization budget, leaving you unable to do the work that you had proposed to do uh, in the first place. So it's in the planning stage, I think it can be helpful to talk to people about um, what something might actually cost. If you want to develop an app, maybe you can reach out and see what development of that app might actually cost, so you can put a, a, reasonable, um, a reasonable budget. Um, I mentioned passive dissemination earlier, so if your plan is just to make your da data available on something that's open access um, repository that's a very passive strategy you may want to consider pairing it with an active strategy to uh, drive end users to that data um, again it depends on how much the particular grant to which you're applying requires knowledge mobilization uh, to be a key component uh, versus if it's just kind of a very small piece of of your application um, another thing is long-term planning. So I keep hating on apps and I don't mean to, um, but apps are one or a website development for, for, for example. People will often develop a website um, as part of a grant, but after that funding runs out, there is no plan to maintain that website and the internet is littered with uh, hundreds of dead websites. So if you're going to create something new that's going to need maintenance or updating, like an app um, that will need to be updated with uh, new phone systems, then consider uh, how you're going to maintain that in the long term. A uh, final issue that we see, as I mentioned, is related to evaluation. So sometimes um, grants do require an evaluation plan and we see either no evaluation plan or a, a poor evaluation plan. And sometimes one of the issues we see with evaluation plans is that the metrics you're planning to evaluate don't line up with your um, your intended outcomes or your stated goals or objectives. So I would say that that's kind of uh, four slides that capture some of the issues that I've seen on a more common basis. However, I also want to mention that the world that I work in tends to be on either um, grants that are focused exclusively on knowledge mobilization or that are uh, focused more heavily on knowledge mobilization. So. Some of these may not apply to your context if knowledge mobilization is just a small component of the grant that you're writing. So these recommendations that I've put up here are essentially just um, reiterating what I've just said, so I'm not going to go into them in much detail. They're there in the resources if you'd like to consult them in the future. Uh, and to close off here, I want to give a shout out to um, two of our upcoming Advantage workshops uh, that are happening uh, this semester. Um, take a look at them on the slide deck and, and please feel free to sign up if they're of interest to you. Uh, we also have more Advantage workshops that will ha happen uh, next semester and our office also offers one-on-one -on -one support. So if you have questions or you want to work on your knowledge mobilization plan, um, and, and run through some ideas with me, please just shoot me an email and I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to chat. So with that, I am going to stop talking um, and I am going to uh, open it up for questions, if anybody has any questions. Please just read just to unmute yourself, um, or if you prefer, you can also type some questions in the chat box. Sean, I saw your hand go up. Is that, uh, do you have a question? Would you like to, you can feel free to unmute yourself and just shout it out if you'd like. Okay. Hi, Sean here. Uh, so 
Can you hear me, Elizabeth? I can. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, first of all, for your very informative and easy to understanding uh, presentation. And I do have a question regarding of the plan language um, part. And I think you have stated very clearly, but I'm just uh, because um, it, it's sometimes it's really, really hard for us to you know, use plain language in a very precise way and also in a short form to um, like state our research uh, results and things like that. And so can you give us some best practices on like what's the like uh, like in, in what level can we use some kind of technical terms and some kind of abbreviations uh, and to better communicate? I mean, in a short form and also precisely. Thank you. No problem. Um, so I would say that um, this is going to be kind of an, an answer, non answer, but a lot of it depends on your audience. So figuring out who that audience is, if your audience is somebody who understands more technical terms, um, then you can use more of those technical terms. Um, this is where I, I really do suggest having a member of your target audience to perhaps read something that you're developing. Um, if you're trying to reach an audience that's um, a more general audience, like a general public audience, for example. Um, I sometimes use the mom test, um, you know, give it to some, I call it the mom test because, you know, I get my mom or my husband or, or somebody to, to read it who doesn't have that technical background and they can tell me, you know, this is what I understand, this is what I took away from it, this part was complete gibberish, you're going to have to just rewrite that. Um, so that's just sort of one easy shorthand uh, way that I use to, to think about plain language. Um, I... Uh, sometimes recommend there's there is as I said there's apps online so Hemingway app is one um, it's a it's a it's essentially a website there's an app that you can download um, or you can just go to the website the website is free you can copy and paste text into it and it will give you suggestions for how to write in more plain language now the suggestions it gives you are going to be more things like um, uh, they won't necessarily be suggesting alternatives for jargon that's specific for your field, but it will be things like shorten your sentence here, um, suggesting those shorter um, non-jargon words that you could consider using instead. Um, yeah, I would say that that's, in general, those would be the things that I would suggest. Um, if you don't know your audience and you don't have a member of your target audience to consult for them to, to look at what you're producing, perhaps go uh, to, is there, is there a website um, that represents them? Can you see what kind of term they use? Can you attend a conference perhaps that they go to um, and hear, listen to the terminology they're using, um, assess how they're using it, are they using it? Sometimes we have um, terms that we use the same word, but we mean them in very different ways, so be aware of that as well. So. Um, that was not a very informative response, I'm afraid, um, but also just a shout out to, to there's a number of different resources on campus. As I, as I mentioned, um, people in our office are available to help you review things. Uh, we can do the mom test uh, for you if that would be useful. Um, or we can, um, we can we can look at your proposal um, if you're in the Co College of Social and Applied Human Sciences. Um, the Community Engaged Scholarship Institute also offers uh, similar services uh, as does the uh, the Ontario Agri Food Innovation Alliance. So there's lots of resources on campus. Just just reach out um, if you'd like some help with something one on one. And it's it's really a habit too. Like once you've it's really hard the first few times you start trying to parse this down. Once you've parsed it down a little bit more, it becomes much easier to do because you know what technology you can use. So that was a very long-winded non-answer, but I hope there was some good information in there. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I saw something come through in the chat box. Let me just uh, bring it up here. Um, are there any strategies to justify a, uh, a larger budget allocation for knowledge mobilization activities and salaries without taking away from research funds in the proposals? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, 
I mean, part of the question would be sort of who are you like, who are you trying to justify it to? Are you trying to justify it to the granting agency or to um, collaborators or perhaps principal investigator who's involved? Um, I would say applying to grants that um, that do emphasize knowledge mobilization uh, is a very good way to have more money allocated to, to knowledge mobilization um, for funding agencies, yeah. So I would say if you can find grants that um, are more specifically focused on knowledge mobilization um, or even grants that are exclusively focused on knowledge mobilization. Um, those do, there's some funding agencies that offer them regularly and there's other opportunities that pop up just from time to time. Um, so I don't know if I can point to strategies uh, per se. Um, if you're dealing with an organization that um, doesn't see that like a funding agency that doesn't see the value in knowledge mobilization. Um, it's a tough call to try and spend more of your budget on it. Um, that said, we're seeing a real push um, federally for knowledge mobilization to be integrated into proposals um, and um, and I would say from from other granting agencies as well. So it's this the emphasis on this is slowly starting to increase. Um, sorry, this is kind of a non answer as well. Reach out to me one on one if you have a grant that you're thinking of in particular, and I'm happy to kind of help brainstorm. The other the other thing is figure out how you can build knowledge mobilization activities into the research itself, like partnering with like doing it some form of integrated knowledge mobilization where you create an end user advisory committee that meets regularly a it's relatively low cost um, and b i think it can be argued that that enhances the research itself um, and so think about how you can integrate that into into the research activities any other questions i can help answer Yeah, hi, I have a question. Um, I know you said that your uh, the field that you're working in is more uh, focused on knowledge mobilization, but I was wondering if the research is more, let's say, um, like theoretically informed. If I do research on uh, corruption and then I look at a particular case and I try to explain why in that country setting, based on the history of that country, what comes out actually makes sense and we shouldn't be surprised that that is what happened. It will be kind of, I would say, too, um, too um, strong to say, okay, my research now informs policy making like you know I can say that but it's like it's made up yeah. so oh, how yeah. would I how would I say that like my audience I think is really mainly a, a, academic to like inform our understanding and I would say it's important for for teaching purposes so it's also like students or like future managers or I don't know like something like that but I always struggle with that knowledge mobilization part. It's really hard it's really especially hard. if you have audiences that are um, you know, your audience is more of the academic side so I would say um, in that case we don't want to make things up because reviewers they they know like they know right they they know that it's made up so don't instead of doing that I think that um, Taking a look, I would say two things. First of all, taking a look at the big picture, um, you know, knowing that this will be part of a body of work that will eventually influence policy and kind of understanding how this is um, one step in the process towards sort of the, the greater impact um, that you'd like to have and mapping out how the activities that you're doing will contribute to that. Um, you know, teaching, for example, you're going to help build a new generation who's going out with this knowledge, etc. Um, again, that's a more a more passive strategy. The other thing that I would suggest is um, 
It might not be a direct policy influence, but um, you know the topic of corruption in a particular country, for example, it's, it's highly not my area of expertise. Um, but I would say, are, is there a non-academic group who would be interested? Is there perhaps a special interest group um, or, or a, a community group who would be interested in um, learning more about that. Um, one great resource that um, we have for as, as academics, if you're trying to get information out to the general public, is The Conversation, um, which I think many people have heard of. It's a, a media outlet that publishes um, academic-based um, articles, and, and um, you will co-write an article with an editor from the conversation to make sure that it is at the appropriate level. So I would look into potentially avenues like the conversation um, to get the message out in sort of a, a general form. Um, and as I said, looking into potentially special interest groups or, or others um, who, who might be interested, potentially to um, this is where sort of that greater academic collaboration can come into play as well, because um, perhaps your work is more theoretical, but perhaps it ties into the work of somebody else who's working in, um, I'm just completely making this up, but, you know, policing reform in that country and, um, you know, your work can inform each other's and it can be part of this greater body of knowledge. So potentially in your knowledge mobilization plan, you can talk about how you're working with um, other sectors, um, of either within academia or outside of academia, who um, could use that research, not in isolation, but as it adds to the greater body of knowledge. Does that help? Yeah, that was really helpful. Thank you. No problem. Mm -hmm. I know we're over time. Um, does anybody else have any quick questions that they'd like answered um, before we uh, before we go? All right, hearing none, um, I just want to emphasize that uh, we are here as a resource for you as you develop your knowledge mobilization plans. Please feel free to reach out. Um, we're happy to help. Um, I will say uh, the more um, time in advance you give us, the more helpful we're going to be able to be. Uh, if you contact us a day before your grant application is due and are looking for feedback on your knowledge mobilization plan, there's only so much help we can provide. But we're, we're always happy to, to review something and, and provide feedback. So please feel free to get in touch. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. Great job, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, and perfect timing too. Yeah, it worked out very well. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll stop the recording and um, I'll just upload it onto the G Drive so that you have access to it as well. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.